Hey everyone, welcome to Live Code Tuesdays. This is a, a weekly live stream where we do live code. And today we are joined by two very special guests. Uh, let me introduce myself first. My name is Sohan. I'm a lead dev advocate at Fermion. And we have, for the first time, Josh from Sivo. Josh, welcome to the show. Thank you very much for having me. I think um been a long time partnering with Fermion, so really excited to be here today. Uh, I've got a history of enterprise machine learning at scale, so really excited to talk about some of the things we'll be discussing today. Um, and also really excited to show how we've been partnering as Siva and Fermion. Awesome. Well, thanks for joining us on the show, Josh. Uh, and we have our regular guest, Radu. Radu, quick introduction for those of you all who might not be familiar. Hello, uh, I'm Radu. I'm the CTO of Fermion. And welcome to another live stream. Uh, really, really happy to have Josh with us to talk to us about how the stuff that we're going to show with GPUs, how it actually works behind the scenes, and what's actually happening in a data center somewhere uh, whenever we are trying to run inferencing. So excited to dive a little bit into all of that today. Yeah, sounds good. So today we are going to talk all about AI, serverless AI inferencing, but also nerdy stuff about GPUs and why it makes sense to run large language models on GPUs. Uh, this is a bit of a continuation from last week where Radu started building an AI app. So Radu, can you maybe take us through what we did last week and what we will be getting into now? Oh, you're on mute. <laughs> Can you see my screen now? Yes, we can see your screen. Okay. So uh, last week we started building a spin application uh, that essentially is a very simple chat application. Uh, and the goal is to build a sort of chat UI interface that lets you uh, exchange uh, prompts using with a large language model. So effectively, if you've ever used something like ChatGPT or Bing chat or something similar, the idea there is to send messages to a large language model and start building the type of, of application where you can make use of, of, a, of a large language model. So the application has a very simple static website that has a chat UI, and then it has a serverless backend built. Uh, both of them are built using a spin application. The serverless backend uh, has a, a simple endpoint where you send a message and then that message gets sent to the language model, it uh, executes an inferencing and then returns the, res the results to the UI. And that's all we got the chance to build up until last time. So this is, uh, let me see if the application is running locally. Uh, so I can give you an, a, a quick demo of what actually, of what we built and where we are. So if I ask it, what is a word, hopefully it will, send it to Fermion Cloud's inferencing service, the serverless AI, and then uh, start typing the message. And that's all we built. Now, a very simple example of why the state of the current application is not great is it has no knowledge of the conversation history, right? It just looks at the last message and then it sends that with no context, no history whatsoever. So if I ask it, what is a bird? It answers me about a bird. And if I ask it about, well, do they lay eggs? And clearly I'm referring to a bird. It has no knowledge of that because there's no persistence around this. So in today's stream and the live coding part of it, we will try to use uh, Spinsky value storage and deploy our application and have it persist, uh, persist the history, conversation history, pass that as a context to the language model, see how it performs when the, the context increases and, and talk about all of that. So. All right, sounds good. Um, for those of you all just joining in, uh, this is Live Code Tuesdays. We are going to be building an app along with Radu and Josh from Sivo. Uh, Josh is also going to tell us about how some of these things actually work under the hood. Right? There's so much talk about AI and LLMs, but how does all of this really work? Well, Josh is going to tell us a bit about that. Uh, let us know where you're viewing this from or if you're building something cool with uh, AI in your apps. Uh, we always love to hear from you. If you just want to say hi, uh, leave a comment and you know we'd love to hear from you. So I, I thought we could actually start this session by sort of discussing what happens when a request to um, an inferencing is actually made. So Radu, maybe you can tell us a bit about the WASM side of things. And then Josh, you can tell us what actually happens in a GPU, which honestly, I'm also very excited to learn about. So Radu, you go first. Sure. Uh, so the Looking at our example that we just built, I think is the simplest way to, to talk about all of this. So essentially, our, our application is pretty, pretty simple, 
right? We have one API endpoint uh, slash API slash generate, and we send a JSON request to that that looks something like this. It has an ID and some content. And essentially, we deserialize that into a JSON object and then use the, the new LLM infer API in the spin SDK, pass the inferencing model that we want to use, in our case, Llama to chat, and pass the content of our, of our message. So whenever we, we type a message here in chat, we send that directly to the language model. Uh, and and uh, we basically wait for a response and then send it back to the to the client to the uh, HTTP response back to the to the user interface. Uh, traditionally, uh, what you would have to do to get this sort of infrastructure is you either use a hosted service that just is an API only platform that gives you an endpoint and that's it, or you would have to stand up a, a VM that has a GPU. And you would have to basically run the model all the time on your own. In this case, uh, we were trying to use a Llama 2 chat model, which is either 7, 13, or 70 billion model. You would have to stand up a GPU, stand up the infrastructure, and run the model on your own, and then send the executor the request there. What we've done with the serverless AI uh, service in Fermin Cloud is we are taking the same application model, the same runtime execution model that we have in Fermion Cloud for everything else. So in Fermion Cloud, you could use things like run a serverless uh, API endpoint, basically a web application that starts really fast. Uh, you can do key value storage. You can use other types of, of data persistence. But the, the way Fermion Cloud runs those is you're not required to run infrastructure unless your application is actually executing at that moment. So we've implemented the way we've implemented the inferencing uh, engine in Fermion Cloud is we are able to take a request, take your, your WebAssembly module that tries to do inferencing and take that request and send it to a GPU cluster running in, uh, in this case in Sivo, and, and have that be able to essentially invert the relationship of one-to-one -one between a user application and the requirement to run a GPU and basically have that um, entirely serverless because of the way WebAssembly starts really fast. So uh, we're able to serve thousands of, of user applications using a small number of, of GPUs. Uh, and that's where I think the, the whenever we send a request to it, the actual GPU is when uh, Josh is uh, able to tell us more about how the GPU actually runs and where it runs and how it consumes electricity and what happens <laughs> below the actual uh, inferencing request. Yes. So, Josh, I think this is the, the super interesting part for me personally because uh, I just take like something like that for granted, right? I'm like, yeah, the GPU, it's going to do its thing uh, and the AI is going to, like, I'm just going to build my AI app. But there's so much fascinating tech things that are actually happening when a request is sent to a GPU. So tell us all about that. Folks watching in, feel free to ask. Here's your chance to ask Josh all your questions about everything about you know, GPUs and AI. Josh, over to you. Yeah, of course. And I think um, what I'll do first is start to demystify the differences between CPU compute and GPU compute. And I think both of those are really important placements in high performance computing. Um, CPUs typically kind of vertically scale, you have cores and threads, and you're able to run those types of well-operated workloads, normally in that kind of x86 type ecosystem. What has been happening, I think, in the past decade and what we've seen a really strong focus around in the last year is actually moving over to GPU compute. And the reason why GPU compute is really advantageous for machine learning workloads is, firstly, you can read and write your data out of the RAM of the GPU really, really quickly. So NVRAM has a set of protocols designed particularly for these types of complex multi-parallel problems that sit alongside it. Being able to read at some speeds up to kind of like 10 hundreds of gigabytes per second between what's calculating your result and also what's storing your data is really important. Of course, alongside that is you can do tens of thousands of horizontal calculations for GPUs as well, which CPUs genuinely struggle with. Um, we've seen a really strong focus around that recently with things like LLMs. LLMs look at huge amounts of data and huge amounts of weights to be able to kind of calculate the result you need. And how and big are we talking, Josh? Like how huge? 
depends on how many parameters you're putting your model through, but it's not unusual to see tens of thousands of parallel computations inside an LLM. Um, and in particular, I think the wider you can make that, the more data you can take into consideration, and hopefully the more accurate of a result you can turn around to your end customers. Um, Particularly the new world, we start to look at more dense types of data, like imaging and sound, et cetera. This high speed access between the NV memory and effectively the end user's experience is becoming more and more important. Um, it's becoming quite interesting because obviously GPUs have traditionally been used for things like video games, rendering compute scenes, and I think they'll always have that use case under their belt. But actually, I think what becomes really interesting is where we start to see it in the context of what we're doing today, which is where actually serverless inferencing is something I think the industry has been banging on the door for for a while. And actually, Fermion have got a really good step forward into making this possible. And some of the things that you'll need to be able to make serverless inferencing possible on top of this really low overhead we have with Wasm is actually being able to load all that data into the model very quickly create up that model very quickly and create an instance of it that the user can call. Um, and a large portion of that also comes down to how you build the rest of your infrastructure, like making sure the data on your hard drive can read across the GPU quickly, you're hot reading and hot loading the data onto that GPU in the right way. Um, I think that's a good start for 10. Nice. Um, we have a couple of people I want to shout out very quickly. Kunal says, hey, everyone. Um, Kunal, thanks for joining in. Kunal is very active in the CNCF space, does a lot of public talks about, um, you know, Kubernetes and things like that. So check out his YouTube as well. We also have Alejandro. Uh, hi, Alejandro. Uh, thanks for stopping by our stream. Where are you watching this from? Uh, would love to hear if you're building something in the WASM or the AI space as well. Hit us up in the comments. Um, Josh, follow-up question for you now. I, we do work with SIBO, and I know you work with Deep Green. Uh, there is an angle of sustainability there, right? And I thought it's fitting to talk about it because this is Sustainability Week uh, in CNCF, and there are a bunch of things happening around it. Check it out if you haven't already. Uh, can you talk to us a bit about the implications of using something like a, like a Deep Green CPU? Yeah, of course. So... To say it very honestly, is that GPUs have always been power hungry cre uh, creations. And I think the challenge we've always had is actually they're really expensive to run. Um, they normally price out a lot of small players in the market. If you're trying to run them on premise, you're looking at thousands of pounds a month with electricity bills. And that's normally if you can get them off the Bitcoin miners who have already been running them for the past few years. The thing we've really tried to do at Sivo is reinvent the concepts about how people request GPUs and really set ourselves different. Um, we like to see ourselves as a little bit of a data center of the future company. So actually, alongside the regular air-cooled NVIDIA A100 80 gigabyte GPUs we offer, uh, we've also partnered with a company called Deep Green. They're an amazing, awesome company who do some really fantastic engineering, particularly in immersion cooling. The product we offer is effectively we have a region on Sivo, which is the deep green region. When you spin up GPUs in that environment, they're actually, instead of being traditionally fan cooled, and obviously fans have an electricity draw on themselves that over a month does add up, is they're actually immersion cooled inside a UK council swimming pool. And that excess waste heat is being used to warm that swimming pool. Um, it's really interesting in the UK. I can't remember if it's every two or three days, but you have to empty and refill that swimming pool. And then what we make a joke about is boil one of the most expensive kettles. Um, and obviously, there's a huge power draw behind that. Um, we think the right way to run and operate that is reduce the cost. And actually, our GPUs come at substantially lower cost than some of our competitors. But then also, we pass that carbon offsetting onto our end users. And the dream is, is that people can build fully sustainable carbon neutral machine learning workloads a lot sooner than these like 2040 targets that people are talking about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And um, our CEO, Matt, had written a blog post about how AI inferencing can actually be carbon neutral if you use something like serverless AI 
powered by GPUs such as Deep Green, right? Because of because of um, how the heat has actually been managed. Um, Radu, I think the overarching idea here really, and we, we'll get to code very quickly, but is about like this democratization of AI, right? Uh, maybe even five years ago, you needed like an entire data science team and uh, like, you know, engineers who were very specialized in AI to actually do AI things. But, you know, now I think any dev can sort of access it. Yeah, and, and I think uh, going back to one second to what, what Josh was talking about, I think the the sustainability aspect is somewhat connected to the, the, the idea that you no longer need either a dedicated team or dedicated hardware or not deep knowledge of how that hardware operates. And, and essentially the way we've tried to build the serverless AI uh, inferencing engine and, and inferring cloud is by assigning a fraction of a GPU to a user application just in time to handle a request, right? And that fundamentally uh, changes the, the nature of the, the, the execution footprint of your application, right? Whereas in a traditional environment, you stand up a container, that container gets a GPU attached to it for as long as your application needs to be alive, that container and that GPU have to run Right? And if you have one request a month or one request a day, then that will always be running. In, in, this, in this model, right, we assign a fraction of a GPU just as you call ln.infer in this scenario. Just as you make an inferencing request, we assign that fraction of a GPU to that user application, execute whatever uh, AI operation there might be in that application, and then shut it shut your application down and then assign that fraction of a GPU to another request coming from the queue. And, and because of the startup, startup time of, of WebAssembly being really, really low, we're talking below one millisecond, effectively that's how fast we can swap between what, what application is attached to a specific uh, fraction of a GPU. And then uh, if all GPU fractions are busy, then whenever the we queue the incoming application uh, request until the next one is available and then swap those really, really fast again. And that effectively has two big implications. The first one is a user never has to wait for a VM or a container to start before a GPU is available and can handle the request. And then for us, it means that we can achieve significantly higher resource utilization uh, and efficiency for the infrastructure. Effectively, we should never have an idle GPU fraction because all of them should be busy handling incoming requests and 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 busy crunching uh, data for for users. And the the thinking about efficiency is what draw drew us initially to to chatting with with Sivo because of their uh, their their work in the uh, in the sustainability part with the green, deep green with the uh, the efficiency of, of how they're they're doing uh, GPU compute. And and to your point, the the sort of service that lets you start using resources that a few even a few months ago would have required you to pay up front for a GPU or be locked into a, an API only platform this sort of, of of making it available for everyone is what I, I'm really excited about services like this and and ties into what you were talking about the democratizing access to these sort of, of capabilities in applications. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, again, for folks just joining in, we are talking about uh, serverless AI and GPUs. And uh, Radu was also showing off an app that he's built. And, and we're going to show some live code about building the next feature to this app. So Radu, one line, um, like a quick recap of what you've built so far. And we can get started now. Yeah, uh, we've built a very simple chat interface. Um, with uh, a an message input text area and two buttons. Whenever you send a message here, what is a bird? Whenever you send a message here and press send, that message gets sent to a large language model, Llama2 chat in our case, which performs an inferencing operation on our context, on our prompt, and then sends the result back. And basically, that's all it does. That's, that's the entire application. That's the entire API endpoint. And because there's no persistence around, uh, it means 
after you send a message, it loses the context entirely. It has no idea what you what you asked even a question ago. So what we want to build next is build persistence into our application and see how we can build a sort of conversation history that lets us continue to ask questions about our, our, our topic, about our conversation topic, uh, without having to copy paste the, the, the result, every, the, the context every single time by having this, this sort of built into the capabilities we can get from the spin application. Specifically, we want to use the, the built-in key value storage to just uh, store the conversation in the key value store and then form the prompt that we're going to send to the to the uh, to the language model. So we'll look a little bit into how we format the conversation for Llama to chat uh, without diving too much into prompt engineering. But it's essentially, by the end of the stream, hopefully we'll have this be able to actually keep track of what we're talking about and be able to uh, persist data in the key value storage while still being able to, to execute inferencing really, really quickly on uh, firm and serverless AI backed by the, the CVO deep green instances that Josh was talking about. In a way, adding persistence, like, is it slightly more sustainable only because, well, you don't have to make a, another call if someone asks the same question, right? Yeah, just, you're just sort of loading it from memory, but yeah. <laughs> uh, that's the second part that we could build next stream, which is uh, a, a key value storage of prompts and responses for very simple uh, prompts. And that yeah. very much tackles onto that, right? If you've seen right. the same question eight times, there's no reason why you should crunch the same data. Uh, and because language model inferencing is not a cheap operation. It takes mm -hmm. significant amount of processing power to actually do. And so it's uh, it's worth investigating how we can avoid doing it when we don't actually have to. Cool. Uh, should we look into how we want to add uh, mm -hmm. Persistence to the app? Yes, let's do that. And for folks just joining in, uh, feel free to ask questions from the chat. Let us know where you're viewing from. We'd love to hear from you. So, you know, uh, send in those comments. Yeah, let's go ahead, Radu. Okay. So basically, currently, we only have the, the notion of a prompt. And what we want to do is define a, a conversation history. So uh, we're just going to build a, a, a history interface. And by the way, if you're interested in, in Tagging along, there's a GitHub repo that I uh, that I created with where we left that off last week, and I'm just going to do the same this week. So if you want to uh, work in parallel or build an alternative implementation of this, you can find everything on, on GitHub. So we want to build a history uh, interface. Uh, and basically, this will just have an ID. And then a an array of prompts, right? And that's what we're going to store in the key value storage. So uh, prompt. OK, so this is what, uh, what we want to store. And this is what we want to exchange between the client and the, and the back end. And basically, at this point, uh, what we want to do is whenever we read the, whenever we read the new request to, to send the, the content to the in the context of the language model instead of just sending it blindly we want to check in the key value storage if we have the conversation history and then uh, if not create one and then store it in the in the key value storage so we're gonna use the the spin documentation to learn about key value storage um, so uh, developer.fermion.com slash spin you'll find an example of how to use the key value store to store non-relational data from, from TypeScript applications. And basically, uh, let's try and do something like this. Let's try and do a try uh, catch block, because there might be things that error out. Uh, or should we leave error handling for as a, an implementation to the yeah, I was leaving out homework to the user. Uh, Who does error handling, Radu? I mean, yes. You know, okay. My code never errors out. I don't need error handling, you know. Yep. Okay. Uh, YOLO, I guess. Okay. YOLO. <laughs> so uh, let chat, uh, let's make that a history. Uh, and then we want to open the key value storage. Uh, KV.open default. And I'm 
import and then if the ID exists, so we're going to use the exists function in the key value store API, so prompt.id. If, if we have a conversation history already in the, in the key value storage, then we just want to deserialize it. So chat is going to be now key value dot get. This one will give us an array buffer. So for JavaScript aficionados out there, we need to basically decode that into a string and then parse it using the JSON object. So we can do decoder dot decode of this. And then that's not, this is a string, so we can do json.parse. Okay, so this one should be a chat. Uh, what happens if we don't find it in the data, in the key value storage, which will be the case for every new conversation out there? Well, we need to create one. So chat is going to be a new object. ID should be prompt.id and then prompts, there's nothing there. So we just create an empty object. Uh, and now we do have a prompt, which is the user prompt. So we just uh, push that prompts dot dot push B. Okay, so now we should have the uh, conversation history with our, with our new prompt from the user. And what we can do is we still send it, but now we want to store it after. So we get the get the request, serve the data, serve the key value storage, create one if we don't find it, add the new prompt, and then send it to the to the language model. Now we have a response. So we have the initial prompt and the response from the language model. We want to save that back to the key value store. So we can do uh, we have to first add it, add the response to the prompts history. So we can do a chat dot prompts that push with the ID being the initial ID and then um, content, which is the response from the LLM.txt and I think we need the role as well because this is the okay. This is the response that the the language model provided us, and we're trying to build an assistant like um, application. So we define the role as assistant, and now we can just save that into the value storage. So kv dot set the uh, key is still the initial ID. And then the value is we can do a JSON dot uh, stringify and just pass the chat. And Roger, so, how important is something like setting a role when you're actually building an LLM, right, or an, anything inferencing, basically? Uh, in this scenario, because we're building an assistant, and we'll look at in a little bit of how to actually set the system prompt and how to to make the distinction and tell the the language model the role and what the what the basically the base prompt is. Uh, you want to make sure that the incoming message from a user is marked as uh, the user role and the the response from the language model is marked as the assistant because. Whenever we send the conversation history, it will look back at all the content, uh, at all the context, and that's the, the conversation history, and it will basically try to continue the conversation based on what the user is asking for. So having the specifically for assistants like applications for this this type of chat application is pretty important to to keep track of who said what. Okay. So at this point, we took the initial uh, body pushed it into our chat and then executed inference and then set it in the key value store. There's one more thing that we need to do in our application before we can actually use it. Uh, anything in spin, you actually have to declare it and you have to, to make sure that your component is able to access. So there's a key value stores uh, field in your spin.saml application 
and we're just going to use the default one. And you can see that we, we do the same thing for inferencing models as well. Uh, if you want to, for your components, have access to a particular model, you have to de declare that ahead of time. Otherwise, uh, your application will just not be allowed to use any of that. So uh, at this point, um, our application should be allowed to execute uh, and to access the key value store. And then uh, let's see if the application is running and let's see whether there's, what is a bird? Hopefully it will still work. Okay, nice. as a type of animal. Uh, okay, do they lay eggs? And yep, it still has no idea what I'm talking about. I asked about birds and it's telling me about cockroaches. Why is that? What's happening? Well, whenever we send the, whenever we do LM infer, it's still only using the context from the last user prompt. So what we need to do is we need to take the entire conversation history and format it in a way that contains the entire context. So instead of just the content, we need to, uh, and I cheated a little bit and, and wrote this function ahead of time. Uh, this is a function that formats a conversation history according to what Llama2 chat expects. So if you if you read the, the Llama2 chat uh, model card from Hugging Face or from from the from the paper, you'll see these instruction tags um, and then the system tags. Basically, uh, this is the, the way you are you have to to format your your conversation history in a way that Llama to chat will understand whose turn is it, what's supposed to happen, and so um, uh, there's one more thing that we could do, which is add a system prompt that I will just. Similarly, cheat and uh, just uh, so we have a system prompt, and now whenever we create our application chat, uh, add the system prompt. And now we'll just use the build llama2 prompt function uh, when passing the uh, the entire context to the language model and just do a build llama2 prompt and pass the chat.prompts. And hopefully this will let us actually keep track of, of the conversation and then and let us keep track of what's happening. So let's clear this. What is a bird? Okay. Do they lay X? And hopefully it will know that I'm talking about birds. Yes. Yay. So, okay. Final thing that we're going to look at is. Uh, just uh, just going to jump in there, Radu, and say for folks just joining yep. in again, we're, we're talking about AI and GPUs. We have Radu, CTO of Fermion, and we have Josh, who's the Chief Innovation Officer at SIVO. Uh, and Radu just built, he already has built an app with an AI inferencing lover, uh, server, AI, serverless AI inferencing uh, feature. Um, and we're just building a KV store so that it remembers, um, you know, uh, conversation history. So there's context to this. All of this can be found at his GitHub. So github.com slash Radu Matai. Am I pronouncing that correctly, Radu? I think I butchered That's that. close okay. enough. Close enough. Okay. <laughs> Sorry about that. Yeah. But you can find it on his GitHub, the links in, in the comments. Um, yeah. And uh, Josh, very quickly, when as Radu is typing out, um, you work, of course, with GPUs and AI. What are some of the use cases you are actually seeing when it comes to you know uh, devs using inferencing in their apps? There's loads of really interesting use cases that we think are hot topics right now. Obviously, LLMs end up being a lot of the conversation people are having. And actually, LLMs functioning as an agent, I think what Radu has just been undertaking, giving them persistence and memory and almost teaching them what they can know and teaching them their own domain, I think is the thing that everyone's really interested in right now. Um, the thing that that will transform is lots of businesses will start to have LLMs undertaking how they're engaging with customers. And actually, I think when you're starting to put those systems together, thinking about how you can make sure you've got the right information, particularly in the context of a customer, makes it feel as human as possible. The hard part about that is obviously the huge amount of data 
and the time it takes for inferencing, which is why I think serverless inferencing could be a really strong master key to the problem that's being undertaken right now. Mm -hmm. um, I'll, I'll call out some of the other generative AI content, though, as well as I think another really interesting use case, things like diffusion models. Uh, DALI 3 came out from OpenAI, which does a really good job of you input text and we'll write that picture for you. Uh, and then the other really interesting one that we've seen Facebook leading with is things like deep voice synthesis, where actually we've been able to deep fake people's video imagery. The next up for that will be interesting things where you can actually start to have a virtual agent sound like you. And these things might all pair together in the near future to actually make some kind of interactive agent people can use. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, we, uh, Radu, we have a question, which and I think you're well positioned to answer this. Uh, we have a question yep. from Holy Odin. Uh, thanks for joining the stream, Holy Odin. Where are you watching this from? Uh, and the question is, is this LLM provided by the Fermion Cloud? Yes. So I'm currently running and developing my application locally. Uh, so this is the, the inner loop developer development process, right? Where I'm literally, I have a, a process that's, that's doing spin watch. So it's, um, it's looking at my source code, watching it. And whenever I save, which is entirely too much, it rebuilds my application and starts it again. And there are two options here. Uh, one, you can run, if you have a powerful enough computer, you can run it on your own machine and you can choose the model you want to run. Uh, if the type of uh, models that we can run and spin today as essentially Llama 2 based models. Uh, so anything based on the Llama 2 architecture or Llama architecture can run in spin today. Uh, that means Llama 2 Instruct, Llama 2 Chat, Code Llama, or any type of fine-tuned or custom model that you've trained that just runs on top of, uh, that it is built on top of the Llama architecture. Uh, when you deploy the Fermion Cloud, we run that model for you in a, in a and effectively uh, what I was talking about earlier, whenever you send a request, we make a fraction of a GPU available to your user application just in time, handle that for you, and then shut your application down. And so, uh, the answer to that question is yes. When you deploy the Fermion Cloud, we run the, the the inferencing service for you, and we make sure that your application can make requests to the inferencing engine uh, in time and then send the response back. There is one more trick up uh, available, which is if you don't have a powerful enough computer, we have a thing called Spin uh, Cloud GPU, uh, which is a way to run your application locally. Uh, so everything about your app will run on your own machine. So it will do, literally do a spin up, except inferencing requests, which require a pretty powerful computer and a pretty powerful GPU. And if you don't have that, but still want to develop your application and, and have that inner loop development experience, uh, you can just do a spin GPU cloud, a cloud GPU in it, and we'll deploy an application that has the API for inferencing, and that's exactly what I've been doing here. So I'm, I'm pointing to an application running in Fermion Cloud. If I go to cloud.fermion.com and I find try to find the Fermion Cloud GPU application, this is the application. This is the, the usage graph for my application over the last hour. So I've been uh, whenever I've been sending a request to my app, it just sends it here. And it's effectively an application running in Fermion Cloud that has available that has access to the, the GPU uh, service that we're talking about and is able to run yeah. uh, pretty efficiently. Uh, yeah, well, I hope that answered your question, Holy uh, Odin. And, and feel free to ask follow-up questions as well. We'd love to hear from you. Uh, and thanks for tuning in all the way from India. Uh, we have another question, Radu. And also, yep. I think this is something you touched upon briefly earlier. Uh, are you planning on guarding slash filtering LLMs against harmful content that goes in or out? like a guardrails or rebuff, which, which yep. I think is a good question. Thanks for the question, Mohammed. Again, uh, where are you also streaming from or viewing this from? I'd love to hear from you. Yeah. Uh, that, that's an excellent question. So uh, part of the reason why we, we went with a pretty restricted number of models in the first release of the serverless AI uh, engine. So today you can do inferencing using Llama 2 chat and Code Llama, the code generation model, and you can generate embeddings in Fermion Cloud using a, an embeddings uh, a model. Part of the reason why we went with those and we went with the official model, uh, not a fine tuning, not, a, not anything else, is because they already have a pretty, pretty significant filtering mechanism built into the model itself. 
which means even if you did try to, to get it to generate harmful content, it will not. Uh, so that's that's the first guardrail. The second one is we're definitely evaluating building uh, a machine learning uh, service that would basically uh, try to detect harmful content. We're, we're discussing that. We don't have a, an immediate plan to build it, but it's something we've definitely thought about and we're definitely uh, investigating how to build it. I am curious whether we have any specifics about whether you're thinking about or th th there are, there's a lot of research happening right now around the safety of language models in general and there's there's a, an ongoing debate about the safety in particular about llama 2 and variants of llama 2 so if you're if you're interested in this i would love to have a, a conversation about that uh we have a discord server where we could catch up if you're interested in talking about all of that i would love to yeah yeah um mohammed uh, is actually tuning in from quebec in canada i love that we have such a global audience today it's it's amazing uh but yeah let us know uh mohammed if if you've worked on something like this this is our discord um, Josh, question to you as well, like, because again, since you work on this, uh, do you get a lot of queries about things like harmful content, potential harmful content? Are you seeing like a lot of dev uh, development around this? A lot of research, I think, Radu initiated. I think the impacts of it are really concerning. So actually people asking the question, like, can an LLM breach GDPR on behalf of my company? I think is what big enterprises are thinking about. Um, the thing I'll say is that we've had bigger challenges in the machine learning space around compliance and been able to still use these technologies to solve those types of problems. Um, this, I think, will be a problem that grows with the solution. So once we get LLMs to a state where we can do things like manage good data privacy, uh, manage the right way to address a user, you know, also be polite, not insult the user, um, will be floored by the next question, which is how do we get this thing to give medical advice? or financial advice, that's where the problem will get a lot more complex as LLM use cases grow. And and that's where the, the scary, to your point, that's where the scary part starts coming in, right? I think the, the, the technology is, is pretty exciting and it's really great to build non-critical applications like contextual chat and bots on top of documentation applications and uh, virtual assistants and all of that. Uh, but I think it's... It, whenever we start talking about applications that have a real impact in the real world, that's where language models, there, there's still a pretty big question mark around trusting or not trusting the output of a LLM. And I'm currently very much in the camp of it's, it's a probabilistic model. Uh, there's no way to get a model to be certain about something or to get the certainty with which it responds reliably so uh there, there's still a little bit uh ways out from actually being able to trust the output that things like a language model is able to give you in particular for things like medical data uh or uh relatedly uh critical types of, of information and i think you know once we solve it once we solve it necessarily for all and i actually think that that's one of the advantages of machine learning platforms like the one we're talking about today is actually that consideration the platform and the infrastructure can worry about how to keep it GDPR compliant, how to keep it in line with all these different types of data privacy, legally compliant, and you can just focus on building high performance modeling. Yeah, yeah, and and I think to to your point, I think currently as much as you can guardrail and and restrict the context that's available and, and ensure that the, the responses you're getting from the model are coming as much as possible from a very specific corpus of data that you made available to the model and making sure that you're not letting it open-endedly generate content. Uh, that's the, the type of the type of application that's quite suitable right now. Uh, so uh, in a future stream, we'll look at how we can do retrieval augmented generation, right? And, and generate embeddings and use them at inferencing time and, and have an entire chain of generate embeddings, get a user content, try to find the closest available piece of information in your database that's related to the user prompt and fetch that from the database and use it as context for your uh, for your uh, for your inferencing request and these types of techniques that that try to to make sure as much as possible that you're not letting your language model generate content open-ended. 
Yeah, great question, Mohammed. And, and yeah, feel free to ask follow-up questions as well. Um, we also have Vladimir from Brazil. Well, very global audience today. Uh, thanks for tuning in, Vladimir. Uh, hope you enjoy the stream. Let us know if you're building something in the AI or the WebAssembly space as well. Uh, Radu, we can go on, get cracking with your app. I'm going to fix my lighting because it's gotten dark suddenly. Uh, let me, I'll be right back. But Radu, you can continue. Sure, thank you. So uh, what we've done, uh, we're, we're now able to get our language model to keep track of what we've talked about previously. So I asked it what it's a bird, it answered me, and then I, I used a, a very open-ended they in that, uh, in that question. It's clearly related to birds, and it's now able to, uh, to keep track of all the context because we are fetching the, the conversation history from the, from the key value storage and then passing that uh, whenever running the inferencing. Uh, I mentioned we're using the, the spin key value storage uh, API. If you look at like uh, we've opened the key value storage, the default one, and then used functions like exists, get, set, and uh, we there there's a way to visualize the state of your key value storage. And we've built a sort of explorer on top of the, the spin key value storage that lets you just look at all the things like everything that's available in your on your key value storage and this is the state of our of our key, kv store we have one conversation uh history which is basically our conversation that we just looked at so well what's a bird that do they lay eggs so if you look at this we see our conversation id and then we have the system prompt uh that's we're telling that to be uh, that it's an assistant and to be con as concise as possible. And then user question, user prompt, assistant response, user prompt, assistant response. Um, if we refresh, we basically lose everything. Even if we do have the conversation ID uh, stored on the client side, just the ID, we don't have any anything else on the around uh the, the ui has no way of, of trying to fetch the the conversation from the key value store so last thing we're going to build is essentially a new api endpoint uh and if we go back to excala draw we we've built the post to slash api slash generate that um generates the response using the llama 2 chat uh and now we want to whenever we refresh get the conversation history and maybe also delete it whenever we press the, the, the clear button. So we're just going to build another API endpoint in our application. So we're going to use the router, uh, router dot, this is going to be a get function and it's going to be on slash API slash ID. And we're going to have a little look at, at how the JavaScript router uh, works in uh, in the spin SDK for JavaScript. And then we'll have an async anonymous function that takes the request. And then that's the function. So uh, we are effectively going to send the request to slash API slash and then the conversation ID. Uh, and we're expecting to just return the entire history back. So uh, keeping in mind what we've done before, we're mostly not going to handle errors. So let's get the uh, ID uh, from, the, from, the, from the request. So this is the, the, the param request. Dot, there is a params field, and then we get the ID. Normally, you would verify whether this is empty or not. Uh, we're going to try to make sure that this is not empty, so we're not going to do error handling for now. But um, we're going to mostly do the same thing with it here. So if the KV exists, then uh, we're going to do that. So let's just write it. If KV dot X, uh, we haven't defined the KV yet. So let KV equals KV dot open the default key value storage, which is the one we've been using so far. So if KV dot exists for our ID, uh, we want to just going to give a uh, quick shout out to it's Anna, Hannah, it's Hannah. Nice name from Kosovo. Again, very international crowd today, Radu and Josh, a bunch of people here to see you. Yeah. Thanks for joining in. It's Hannah. 
think you could just return a byte array here. So if the key, uh, if the key value exists, the pair exists, then I think we can do a return uh, status of 200 and then body. I think we can do again, keeping in mind that you should actually do error checking here. Uh, KV get of ID. And that's it. That's all you need to get this from the key value store and return it. And then maybe an else uh, return status. Let's do a 404. And that's it. Uh, and I think that should be enough on the on the API side. Let's have a quick look at the UI for this. And uh, I slightly cheated and built uh, this way, way back when I uh, created the UI for this. So we're just going to do a fetch request from the browser to slash API slash that conversation ID. And then for each prompt in there, we're just going to add the message to the history. So hopefully, we'll, we'll just do the same thing that we've done so far and just append to, the, to our uh, to our chat UI here. So assuming everything started, let's, what is a bird? Today lay eggs. And hopefully whenever we refresh the page now, we should be able to, yeah, uh, we now have our uh, conversation. Nice. Uh, if we, if we refresh this, this is from the previous conversation that we've had before. Uh, but now if we refresh, uh, we can send the link to someone, we can get the, the conversation history. Uh, there's one more endpoint that we could build, which is the, the clear one, because this one, it just, um, it just deletes it from the, uh, deletes the conversation ID from the client, but it doesn't actually delete the, 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 the entry in the key value store. So I guess we could just build that really quickly. Uh, if you want to uh, ask some questions or uh, get Josh to answer a question while I do that, it's literally going to look virtually identical to this one. It's just going to be a, a router.delete. So I'll just uh, right. do that quietly. Yeah, <laughs> okay. So we, maybe we'll take the, the screen share off. Uh, folks, feel free to ask any questions if you have any uh, while Radu clacks away in the background. Um, Josh, question for you. So you're at the forefront of this revolution with AI and GPUs, right? So what does the future of the data center look like in terms of performance and prices, sustainability? Uh, everyone is moving to the cloud. That is, that's, I think, a given. So how does this look like in the future? Yeah, absolutely. I think at Siva, we use a very different terminology with the word cloud. I think mm -hmm. a lot of that's been set historically over the last decade with uh, previous companies who built cloud solutions for problems which we were challenged with 10 years ago. The way we think about it in a kind of data center of the future kind of way is if you could reimagine everything you do with a cloud computing platform today, what would it look like? And it's built for today's problems whilst ensuring that we can take the people who built the cloud historically on the journey with us. I think um, we spoke a little bit earlier about things like immersion calling our GPUs and actually your data center maybe being something like a swimming pool. Um, and there's lots of conversations you can have. I've seen some examples of uh, wind turbine energy powering lots of the data centers and actually being able to do things like wind turbines and swimming pools as data centers kind of solves the age old problems we've had with CDNs, which is about being mm -hmm. distributed and close to the user. And traditionally, the way we've always thought about machine learning workloads is one big data center with loads of GPUs hidden in it, and it always runs hot. I think um, Radio had some really good points earlier, actually, and I think actually Matt's blog post about um, AI inferencing and sustainability is a really good, mm -hmm. a really good positioning to that. If your car's running, but you're not going anywhere, <laughs> yeah. why are you turning over the engine is the question we always ask ourselves as machine learning engineers. Um, and I think trying to build infrastructure that starts to time slice and use that more efficiently, really important. On the flip side, I think we've never had as large or complex models as we've had today. Now, there's a big quantity versus quality conversation going on right now. Um, 
we have a bit of a big data bias, I think, from the whole big data campaign that we existed during the last five years. Um, but actually, I think what we're seeing with things like LLMs is actually quality over quantity. And the people who hold that high quality information normally are big enterprises who have that stuff as a gold mine. And we had the whole data is the oil methodology. Yeah. I think things like LLMs can be what's piping that oil to use a very unsustainable adage. <laughs> okay. Interesting. Yeah. Um, well said, Josh. And uh, uh, definitely agree with you that that uh, I'm so glad that people are talking about sustainability in tech uh, and so on. Uh, just this is Sustainability Week uh, in the CNCF, the Cloud Native Computing Foundation. And uh, the stat that's going around is that the software industry contributes to about 3% of the worldwide carbon emission, which is as, almost as much as the airline industry, right? So us as technologists can actually make a big change in uh, how we consume energy in terms of how our software works, in terms of how our hardware works, and so on. So all of us can make a difference. I'm glad people are talking about it. All right, let's uh, check back with Radu. Radu, what do you have for us? Uh, well, it wouldn't be a live stream without console log debugging. So yes, my favorite. That's time. where we are. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, looking in the key value explorer, we did generate the, the entry in the key value store. And now we want to clear. So we did send a delete request to this, but it returned a not found. So let's see what's happening. It's clearing the history for BB2680E which is the right ID that was sent from the UI. But then this one has a different ID. So no idea why. <laughs> Josh, you were mentioning um, something else about the data center thing, right? That... Yeah, absolutely. I think. Um... Some of the really interesting parts, actually, and you know, the example Radu is doing right now, I think, is a really good example, which is that things like LLMs have been the integration of the components. In this situation, obviously, a database is a really critical part of that. And if you think about casting your mind back eight to ten years, what you would traditionally see is someone going physically into a data center, slotting in a server. Yes, right. Like, 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 like rack and stack. Exactly, and. I remember doing machine learning like Radu's doing and having to go plug that server in myself, right? Mm. And then install Postgres onto it. So actually you think about how there's a huge overhead in doing successful machine learning. Mm. Um, we've thrown some stats about that historically around and actually we think about 75% of the effort people spend on the cloud with machine learning is normally configuring infrastructure and getting that stuff set up. Um, and that isn't what people want to be spending the time with. And I think to some of your points earlier, Sohan, around democratization of AI, if you're a doctor or a scientist and you really want to make efficient use of these machine learning paradigms and someone says, go down to the data center, plug in some cores, install Postgres, it's a really strong barrier of entry. And you know, to build on the point I discussed earlier about how this quality data sits within enterprises, Normally, it's not understood by computer scientists or machine learning engineers. It's that intersection computing versus domain where we've always tried to cross over and make those things work. So I think things like the Fermium platform allow people who aren't machine learning experts to come in. And actually, with the rise of everyone learning WASM, some really interesting ideas here that actually could non-computer scientists start to grapple with some of these problems as well. Yeah, I agree. And and speaking of which, uh, folks, feel free to ask any questions in the chat. We have Radu and Josh, and we'll be ar around for f maybe a few more minutes. Uh, I, I see Radu with uh, a little bit of an exclamation, celebratory exclamation, maybe. So I think it's things have worked. Oh, wait, Radu, you're on mute. That's my bad. Hold on. Sorry. Yes. Uh, this was no machine learning error. It was a good old, I was 
creating a new conversation ID before deleting the old one. So oh. this was very, very like nothing that console log debugging uh, <laughs> won't, won't help with. So this is what this is where we are, right? We have nothing in the key value storage, uh, no conversation ID. Uh, create a new conversation that will make its way into the key value store. We can inspect it. And finally, when you do a clear and refresh the key value store, that data is gone. So in about like uh, less than 80, 100 lines of code, we've built three API endpoints, one to get the conversation history, one to delete the conversation history, and one to uh, create the uh, create the API endpoint that generates uh, generates content by sending it to the language model based on your entire uh, conversation history. In this is still twenty three lines of code. So uh, using the the JavaScript uh, using JavaScript and uh, Spin and Fermion Cloud. And so the last part here is Spin Cloud deploy which will take our application that we've uh, worked with locally and just push it to Fermion Cloud where basically anyone can try it out. So hopefully uh, this will succeed. Uh, we've been using the, the GPU and the Fermion serverless AI all along, even when the application was running locally. So we know for a fact that that just works and it's pretty fast. So we have my industry map something. Uh, we have a URL that everyone can can go to hey and this is really really fast when was da Vinci born what is he known for and now we have a full uh conversation id and again nice. i'm obviously biased but uh i'm really really blown away by how freely ridiculously fast this is this is like sending data to a pretty big large language model and just making the round trip to uh so I'm, I'm pretty pretty happy with how this is turning out uh what is his most famous work and uh, again this is like crunching the entire context for the conversation and uh, sending it back uh, i'm thinking next time we could build a, a little uh, utility that summarizes the conversation and gives us a title. So, mm -hmm. uh, uh, and then think a little bit more about can we share com conversations across uh, users, right? Because right now the conversation ID is stored on the conversation ID is stored on my uh, local browser cache. And yeah. so there's no clear way for me to share it with you, for example, so we can collaborate on the application on the chat. So there are lots of things that I'm, I think we can build next. Yeah. Uh, so. Yeah, uh, folks, uh, I, I saw a bunch of folks just joined in. Um, Radu has been taking us through this piece of code, which is a, kind of like a chat application with an assistant. Uh, we have built a KV store, so there is persistence. And that the link or the code for all of this is the link that you see down there. Um, yeah, uh, folks, again, if you have any questions, feel free to ask right now. Uh, oh, Radu is committing code live. We can actually <laughs> see live committing of code. Oh, <laughs> uh, well, if you're putting me on the spot, then I'm going to have to be careful about what I uh, <laughs> add conversation history. Uh, yeah, go, go on. I'm just going to mm -hmm. craft the commit message here. <laughs> yeah, no worries. Um, actually, Holy Odin asks a question, which is, can you explain how serverless AI things work under the hood? Uh, we, we spoke about this briefly at the top of the stream, uh, Holy Odin, but I can give you a quick recap about the WASM side of things. Essentially, we have um, NVIDIA A100 GPUs running in the cloud. So when you use, maybe I'll just quickly mute Radu because he's clacking away. Mecha mechanical keyboards. <laughs> um, yeah, so when you essentially use serverless AI inferencing in like a spin app, uh, that is being time shared by a bunch of different people who are doing it. So you can do it really fast and you can do it for much cheaper than actually renting out your own GPU and running it in the cloud. And this you know, makes a lot of sense because regardless of if you were running um, a container with uh, you know, like a large language model running in the cloud, 
if you ran like one request per month or one request per second, you'd still have to have that actually running. But with serverless, you can only you know use the GPU for the time you make the request. And and Mark, maybe sorry, Mark, uh, <laughs> Josh, maybe you can give and tell us how this actually works under the hood, like a quick recap, perhaps. Yeah, of course. So I think one of the really important parts here is we're taking some of the data that's been stored in things like the database and the KV database that Radu put together earlier. And I think the um, really important part is they were really simple to add in via very simple software SDK. From there, it's taking that information, making sure that that information is readily available. Obviously, the really impressive part here is starting up the model with a very minimal overhead and getting that written up loading that data in and then very quickly returning an inference result back to the end user that will be ran over the GPU. I think as uh, Sohan mentioned, will be time shared across many users. Um, the cloud concept of economies of scale here are really important. The more people who can run that GPU on mass, the more power we can save as consumers, but then also I think the, um, the more efficiently we can run these types of workloads. From there, that GPU is firing up for only the time it needs to process the calculations normally parallelizing that across very many different more streams than a CPU could normally manage, returning the result back to the user. And then I think the most important part that will impress people most today is freeing up and letting the next person run their workload or scaling back down to zero. Yeah, that, that's pretty much what happens under the hood, um, Holy Odin. Um, and again, if you want to get started, I think, again, very biased, but this is a great way to get started with building your first AI app, right? Say you have no experience with AI, whatever, because with Spin, you can either code in Rust, in TypeScript, and in Python, right? So any of these languages you can pick, you can do a hello world using AI. Uh, it's all there when you go to fermion.ai or just look up our GitHub as well. We have a bunch of different examples. Maybe if I can just find the link. Yeah, there we go. GitHub.com slash Fermion slash AI examples. So great way to get started. Um, Radu, yes. So maybe a quick recap of what we've built so far and what we'll do next week at roughly the same time. Yeah. Uh, so we started with a very simple chat interface that took a message sent to the chat and just sent that directly to the uh, language model. And in the last hour or so, we built Persistent using the key value store uh, and effectively stored the conversation ID every single message, uh, either sent by user or from the responsible language model, saved it into the key value store, into the built-in key value store. And uh, whenever sending the next message, we would also get the entire conversation history format it in a way that the Llama 2 chat model that we're using expects it for a, for a certain type of turn-by-turn -turn conversation, uh, send that to the language model, and then uh, store uh, the entire conversation ID. Uh, and then finally, uh, also built the, a way to retrieve the conversation ID, uh, so another API endpoint to do that. Uh, that's, our, that's our API endpoint here, and then uh, built another one to remove all the data associated with a specific uh, with a specific conversation ID. So whenever we do clear, that data is actually deleted from the key value store. So we the application retains no data whatsoever about the uh, about the application, about the conversation that we've just had. And then again, in about 23 lines of code, we've built the entire uh, API generation endpoint that get the history, formats the the prompts accordingly and uh, and send it to the language model. Uh, next time, I'm thinking that we could build a, uh, a an, an API endpoint that takes our uh, takes our conversation and generates a three four word summary about it about a conversation. So we would basically change the the text here. Uh, so instead of it being the same static text, it would actually be. Uh, a summary of the conversation up until this point in our in our uh, in the conversation, and then maybe build a way to share conversation conversations across users. So I can send Sohan a link, and he would be able to just continue the conversation with me or something similar. So we're going to continue building this application. We might just add a few Rust components just because I think Ooh. I've hit my limit on. Uh, on the amount of JavaScript or TypeScript <laughs> I can write live and not handle any sort of uh, 
error handling at all. So uh, I'm, I might just do a little bit of work after the stream to add some, some error handling to this, just because it really bugs me that we're not handling <laughs> anything at all. So well, welcome uh, to live code, YOLO coding. <laughs> <laughs> We don't do well, that's how you know it's that, that's how you know it's actually live coding and not uh, anything else. So, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah well, I'm looking forward to it, folks. Uh, again, uh, I have to do this, but do like, share, and subscribe because you know you'll get notifications for the other streams that we do. We will be streaming at the same time next week as well, where we're continuing this app. Hope to see you there as well. Um, Josh, one final question before we close the stream. Any last words about AI GPUs? Um, what folks have to look at? Oh, sorry, uh, as devs. I think everyone building applications now has a responsibility to think about the sustainability aspect of their machine learning workload. So, Han, I, I think what you said about comparing the tech industry to airline industries is a really powerful statement. And actually, it's, it's, it's code written differently that changes us from being that industry. Um, I think alongside that, we're trying to make sure that the GPU compute and the products we offer really do hit the right mark with our customers. Obviously, Siva have a variety of things like GPU instances, GPU computes, and obviously managed ML platforms. Um, I think the other thing that I'm really excited about is also seeing some of the Fermion serverless inferencing grow. And actually, some of these use cases come together. Um, so, A, thank you for having us on, and B, looking forward to working together again. Awesome. Yeah. Um, folks, you can quickly also check out sivo.com to learn more about Sivo and what they do or hit up Josh on LinkedIn, Twitter, whatever. Uh, one final question from Holy Odin. Uh, not learn JavaScript, but correct me if I'm wrong. Yes. So this example was using TypeScript uh, Holy Odin, but you can do the same thing in Rust or in Python. Uh, it is WebAssembly, and one of the things about WebAssembly is it's uh, completely portable. So you can write code in any language. Um, it converts it to a WASM file, which can run on any system that has a WASM runtime. Right. So next week, Radu will probably do some Rust as well. So do join us there. No, sp not too many spoilers, but yeah, we're going to continue building the app. Uh, anyway, Josh, Radu, thank you so much for joining in and everyone in the chat watching us as well. Thank you so much. Hope you learned something new and we will see you next week. Till then, goodbye.